Hello and welcome to 3ABN Today. My name is John Lomakang, but if you're part of our family, you know that. Thank you for taking the time today to tune in to a very exciting and informative program. And I want to thank you for your prayers and your financial support of this network as we continue going and growing, getting ready for the soon return of Jesus. You know, everyone is on a journey. You're sitting down right now, maybe standing up. You may be with your family or by yourself. You may be listening in your car or watching in a church. But today, it's about journeys. Everyone has a journey. We have a beginning point, and then we come later in life to understand where the Lord always knew that we would be. Today, our guest is going to talk about his journey, his spiritual journey, his psychological journey, his journey of adjusting from where he was to where he is, not only himself, but his family. And if you're on a journey, maybe a spiritual one, wondering where the Lord is guiding you, I really encourage you to stay tuned for this exciting and informative program. Not only informative, but I also believe it's going to be transformative. But before we get to our introducing our guest, uh, Sam Acampo is going to play a wonderful piano piece entitled, What a Precious Friend.
Thank you, Sam, for that wonderful rendition of What a Precious Friend Is He. I think it's a very good note to segue uh, to introduce our guest for today, uh, Dr. Robert Knorr, uh, Family Ministry Coordinator of the Milwaukee Seventh-day Adventist Church. So good to have you here today. Thank you, Pastor John. It's great to be here. Yes. I am particularly excited about our interview today because of what we talked about prior to uh, coming on the set, but we have people that are watching the program and that are listening to the program, and they might say, I don't know Dr. Robert North, so give us kind of a, a summary, a nutshell of who you are and what you do right now. So I'm a clinical psychologist in Milwaukee in private practice. Okay. Uh, I'm also with my wife, Dee Pekarik, uh, co-family ministry coordinator at Milwaukee Central mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay. And uh, your medical background, give us a, give us a you're a clinical psychologist. Right, so I have a PhD in clinical psychology. Okay, so you're not just, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sitting here like a, a launch pad uh, fighter jet because I know that we're gonna catapult into a very interesting journey that you've experienced. And um, give us a little bit about your background. You just summarized what you do and the church you're working with, but kind of walk us through your journey because your journey is very interesting. Uh, not totally unique because other people have had journeys, but each one of us has a fingerprint in our journey that no one else can share. Talk about that. Right. So I was raised in a suburb outside of Milwaukee mm -hmm. uh, in a Catholic family. Mm -hmm. I attended a Catholic grade school, uh, and my mom was a praying mom, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted us to, to know the Lord Jesus and sent us to the Catholic school. And so, uh, I, you know, it was an important part of my childhood experience. I was always the kind of kid who was taking faith seriously, mm -hmm. uh, very interested in that. And so, of course, you know, in, in a Catholic family, if you're a highly interested young man mm -hmm. uh, in faith, the path of the priesthood mm. is something that comes up for consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the path that I chose. Wow. So from a, at what age did you think that that's what I want to do? Well, I thought about it even in uh, grade school, uh, going into ministry, and uh, I think it was somewhat solidified. My family went through a rough time that ended in my parents' divorce uh, when I was about 13. Mm. And there certainly were community members, teachers there at the school that were really supportive of me at that time and having to rely on my faith uh, in some ways mm -hmm. uh, that maybe some other kids didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it just sort of crystallized that uh, hey, I really need the Lord in my life, and this seems to be the way mm -hmm. to do that. So having this, this aspiration that um, at, a, at a critical juncture in your life, you know, anytime we experience anything as traumatic and 13 years old, you have to choose almost emotionally which parent you want to stay with, but then again, you're caught in the middle any way you look at it. And then when your faith community steps in, it gives you a foundation and I'm assuming then at that time, your faith community, being the Catholic community, just really embraced you, the, the priests and everybody just was there to help you through a tough time. That's right. Uh, you know, there were teachers, there were friends of my, uh, the parents of my friends mm -hmm. at that age that uh, took an extra interest in me and, you know, gave me some spiritual encouragement and, and wanted to be sure I had what I needed mm -hmm. uh, as I was going through some difficult things in the family time. And I think that somewhat solidified uh, certainly my understanding of how much, you know, faith uh, makes a difference mm -hmm. in a person's life. But somewhere this journey continued and, and there, there at, at some point there was a fork in the road, uh, 13 years old, <clears throat> family going through divorce. At what point in your, your years following that, that this spark of a different interest start to seep into your life? So I think it was probably my freshman year of college when I was thinking more seriously about ministry mm -hmm. and I decided to go into the seminary. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up finishing my undergraduate and then I ended up doing my graduate studies in Rome. So I spent three years across the street from the Vatican wow. uh, studying theology mm -hmm. and went all the way through to being ordained as a deacon and being ordained as a Catholic priest. Wow, so you really, I mean, you didn't lose trajectory. You just went all the way to the top thinking, well, this is what I'm going to solidify myself in doing, and this is going to be my life practice. That's right. What happened? So I was ordained, and I was serving as a priest, mm -hmm. and there were 
many aspects of ministry that I really liked. I liked preaching, I liked the pastoral counseling, uh, but I began to question the mandatory celibacy requirement. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if I had given up too quickly on the idea of a wife Mm -hmm. and children. Maybe some of the messiness of my parents' divorce played into that, like, oh, that just looks hard. Maybe I'll just go over here. Right. Um, so I'm questioning whether perhaps I gave up on that too quickly uh, and experiencing some loneliness. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be honest, it, you know, if it had just been, oh, this isn't a fit for me, maybe I'll just leave, that would be one thing. But I think uh, the other thing that happened is I was looking around at my friends in the priesthood and, and really concluding that it seemed like there's a lot of people for whom this was not working well mm -hmm. as a system. You know, there definitely were dedicated individual mm -hmm. followers of Christ, of course, uh, in, in the ranks of the priesthood. But looking at it as a system, I, I'm just noticing there are a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. It seems like for a lot of guys, they're, they want to be a Christian leader and they're trying to make this piece fit mm -hmm. versus really saying, oh, I really feel called by God to this unmarried state. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm seeing, to be honest, I'm seeing problems. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing priests violate celibacy secretly. I'm seeing loneliness and alcohol abuse at times. Like, like when you're trying to make something fit right. that doesn't fit, mm -hmm. things don't always go so well. So I'm starting to question um, at a systemic level, if this is really the best way to pick leadership, to choose leadership from a small sample of, you know, unmarried males, right. uh, you're, you're, you're knocking out a lot of people who could be good, good leaders when, you, when you're doing it that way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I start to think, well, you know, if the church I'm in can be wrong about something so fundamental, like how to pick leadership. I mean, that's going to permeate many, many aspects of right. church functioning. If it could be wrong about something that fundamental, maybe I also have to ask some other harder questions. So, uh, so then my personal journey took me uh, to graduate school for psychology, and I did leave the priesthood, and I had the goal to, to date and find a, a good Christian woman to marry. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, when you think about it, and I like the way you put that together, because to be a part of the priesthood, you really are declaring, uh, committing your life to celibacy. But at the very same time, when you look at the very beginning of the Bible, the Lord gave to Adam a wife, Eve. And he says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so he gave, he gave these qualities and these abilities and that were actually required to be suppressed to function in the capacity of a priest. Right. And, and as I said earlier, I think, you know, of course, there are individuals who are called to that single life. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to the notion that you're going to find enough leaders out of that smaller pool uh, seems forced and, and doesn't seem to, to serve the church well, in my opinion. Wow. What was the name of the lady that you met? Dee Pekarik. Okay. Tell us Fourth about generation it. Seventh day Adventist from Michigan. Wow. Um, wow. And what did you all meet? We were both working at a psychiatric hospital for troubled children. At that point, I was in my graduate studies for psychology, but I needed a part time job to support mm -hmm. myself. And she was looking at entering into graduate school for psychology. So we were both working on this hospital unit for mm -hmm. troubled kids. And immediately, I was impressed with how great she was with the kids. And Fast forward, she eventually became a child clinical psychologist hmm. and is the co-family ministries coordinator at Milwaukee Central. Okay, um, happened to be your wife. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I was impressed with how she was with the kids and she tells me she was impressed with how I was with the kids. Okay. Um, and I was also impressed with what a intense Christian she was. Mm -hmm. um, to be perfectly honest, I always thought, well, whoever I marry, I'm going to be the more intense Christian. I mean, I went all the way into the ministry, right. um, and I, I now see the point, she is the more intense Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and from day one, I, I was just impressed with that. Uh, and so she started telling me more about her Adventist background. Mm -hmm. And uh, our spiritual discussions were part of the great connection we had right from the beginning. I could see that. I mean, I could see that. I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall on the day when you guys just started talking about these divergent views, these views that were uh, because of emotions and because of the spark that was obviously there, you were going to find a way to negotiate through these just so this relationship could make it. 
but, um, but then there's this deep interest because you discovered, I like the way you said that, she was an intense Christian, right. intensely devoted, and then you came out of this whole culture of Catholicism, right. bringing with it a wealth of knowledge. Uh, that was an interesting journey. What were some of the topics you talked about? I mean, do you remember the first thing you talked about? Well, we were, I think we were sitting on a, uh, sitting on a bench watching our, t we, we'd have these teams of kids we had to watch, but we could have a couple of minutes as staff members um, just to sit and, and talk a little bit. And, um, and we just, were just talking about, she said something like, uh, I've always wanted to be either a stay-at-home mom or a medical missionary doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course now she's a part-time stay-at-home mom and part-time psychologist. So she got pretty <laughs> close mm -hmm. to her dream. And, uh, and you know, she was open to talking about it. Uh, I talked about my background and, uh, and we just compared notes and uh, she was, she was very into her faith, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, she, she did not shy away from uh, saying that she felt like her faith had created the spiritual conditions uh, that had really helped her to grow. And, uh, and we just started comparing notes on that. So the day evidently came when maybe, did she invite you to go to church? Right, so, so a lot of things are happening at this time. So, you know, we're dating and we're falling in love. And so we really want to make this work. Of course, we, we know we've got, we're joined as followers of the Lord Jesus, but right. we know we're going to have some issues, so to speak, um, of how we're going to work this out. Mm -hmm. And so um, this leads to what I would call my rough start with Adventism, <laughs> if I could call it that. Um, you know, so she was relatively new to the Milwaukee area, so was still looking at, you know, multiple Adventist churches as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the truth of the story is that the first, well, two out of the first three times that I stopped into an Adventist church, the preacher was up there really ripping into Catholics. Wow. Um, and I have to be honest with you, and I don't mean just, you know, prophetic proclamations. I'm, I'm all for prophetic proclamations. Right. I'm here to make one today that I am grateful that God has led me to this light. Amen. Um, but I'm talking about, you know, sort of personalizing. Inordinately. Yeah, yeah de demeaning, you know, implying people couldn't be working with the Lord. And, um, and, and, and that really set me back. It mm -hmm. took a while to overcome that first impression. Now, now, later, I would realize that I could have walked into an Adventist church a hundred times and, you know, 95 times I would have heard something completely different. But, but first impressions matter. Right. So I did have this sort of setback like, whoa, I, I don't know if I could ever join this group. That, you know, if this is what they're about, <laughs> they seem more about, you know, tearing down other people than, than saying what they're for. Right. Um, and, and, of course, all of that would change as I got to know the Adventist people and I got to know a number of Adventist ministers up close, right. um, but, but it was a rough start and it's a good reminder. We should always think about who might be sitting out there and, right. uh, and follow Mrs. White's counsel that, you know, we're not here to tear down. We're not going out of our way to attack right. other denominations. It, you know, matter of fact, the Bible says, Jesus said it himself, if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Yes. Uh, somebody asked me recently, when you go to a church, uh, uh, how do you decide what to preach after you have seven or 800 sermons? And I said, you can never go wrong if you lift up Jesus. And so that's, that's very important. I'm glad right. you brought that up. You right. can never go wrong if you right. lift up Amen. Christ. He will draw people to mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. But um, so now you're, you're, you're negotiating, uh, uh, I won't say a mediocrity, a maze of mediocrity, but you're negotiating and you're kind of, all right, oh, whew, so much for that experience. How do we continue there? Because right. this D, who is this, uh, who's finding a home in your heart and mm -hmm. you're finding a home in her heart and she's probably wondering, oh, okay, uh, Bob, this is, I understand, uh, you know, hold on, this is not how it always exactly. is. And, exactly. Uh, and so the journey continues. And let's talk about this transition to where you kind of sever and connect. So then, so then we walk into Milwaukee Central SDA and Pastor Rodney Mills and his wife Pam are, are the pastor and the pastoral team. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Rodney's area of expertise is, is evangelism and it really showed. Mm -hmm. uh, he just, well, he and Pam just welcomed us so much. I mean, just said, hey, you're welcome to participate as much or as little as you want. We're glad you're here. You know, at that point we were young adults mm -hmm. and, and, and with a sort of complicated mm -hmm. story going here. 
Um, and everybody wants to keep the young adults, of course, and he was, he was really good at it and just, just welcomed us. Uh, we got involved in music, um, and he did uh, offer me some Bible studies mm -hmm. that planted uh, very deep seeds in me. He, uh, you know, he'd sit down, and we had a lot of fun with that with our two backgrounds, right. uh, having these theological discussions. Um, and, you know, he showed me uh, some of the, 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 the biblical basis of Adventism, mm -hmm. you know, so things like saying, well, hey, do you think there's still wisdom in do not commit adultery and, and do not steal? And I'd say, yeah. He's like, well, then how about the Sabbath? It's in the same list. Do you think there's still some wisdom in that? You know, <laughs> this kind of thing or showing me passages where Jesus anticipates the Sabbath will continue right. after he's gone. And I'm like, oh, there is a logic to this. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a biblical basis to this that I'd never really looked at. So, so some very deep seeds between his welcome and his Bible studies. Mm -hmm. um, and then what happens at Milwaukee Central is I'm just... <sighs> I'm just sort of falling in love with these people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm getting such a good welcome from them. And I'm looking around and I'm noticing, like, what is it with these Adventists that they, they shine so brightly, right? Like, like we're supposed to be the light of the world. And it's right. like, all these people are like, why are they all 200 watt bulbs instead of 60? <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, it's like, well, 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 yeah, everybody gives more than 10% of their income. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Nobody does that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we spend all day, uh, you know, worshiping God and reflecting on the word. I say, well, what are you talking? Nobody does that. Nobody stays in church all day. Right. Yeah. And, and so I'm experiencing this um, and I'm like, wow, I'm just very impressed. And I'm starting to enjoy spending these whole days with our music group, you know, just not doing any work and, uh, and you know, just resting in the Lord and um, having these spiritual conversations. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's like it is my community, even though it's not yet officially my community, right. it's really what's happening. And, and I give so much credit to that congregation for loving me as I was, mm -hmm. not just what I might be someday right. as a member, but already loving me as I was, um, just the ultimate sign Jesus gave of his true followers, of That's course. Right. Not with ulterior motives. Right. It was disinterested benevolence, just exactly. showing who exactly. they are rather than a uh, sales pitch exactly. or, or prerequisite to just reeling you in. Exactly. And that's important. I, I'm glad you bring that up because a lot of times uh, people even give Bible studies with an ulterior motive in mind, right. Right. or they have conversations and they just mm -hmm. can't wait to throw that hook in there uh, as though they're fishing all the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even the Bible says it is the goodness of God mm -hmm. that leads us to repentance. Right. You know, it's not the doctrines of God that leads us to repentance. Those come after. And when we have a love relationship, this love connection, mm -hmm. a genuine scriptural love for one another, a, a really an interest, in, an interest in your well-being as well as mine, it tends to come across more genuine than just saying, hey, Bob, how long is it going to be before you join our church? Exactly. And there's some exactly. people that have that. And now, I want to just add this. You may have run into some of those people that may have asked you that question because there are some that just kind of cut to the chase. So, hey, I heard you're not an Adventist. When is it going to be? Uh -huh. You know, and that throws people sometimes. And what I got actually, Pastor, was much more um, wonderful invitations. Wonderful. Uh, along the way, people said, you know, you certainly could be baptized, mm -hmm. or uh, I wonder if God's calling you to more in this church, but mm -hmm. they were very inviting, right. uh, you know, kind of a thing. Delicate. And, uh, and just accepting me as, you know, sort of that, I guess the, the old, the old God-fearers in the Jewish days, they weren't quite Jewish, but they were sort of hanging around, and they just accepted me in that capacity for a long time. And that's, that's very good, yeah. because you're on this journey. I mean, as a Catholic priest, you're coming out of uh, you're not just coming out of a theological experience, you're coming out of dogma. Mm -hmm. You're coming out of the deep-seated understanding of that's A, this is B, mm -hmm. and the two don't mesh. I mean, because the Sabbath was one, but then when did you, how did you handle the uh, understanding of well, what happens when a person dies? I mean, that's just something that's quite different. Right, so that was part of uh, Pastor Rodney Mill's Bible studies with me, was showing me that there is a biblical basis, mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, for the state of the dead doctrine. Uh, and, and once again, I was growing in respect for right. it because I was getting a presentation of it 
you know, that was really showing, hey, here's the biblical basis, mm -hmm. um, and, and here's some of the implications of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, just the way it was presented, it was easy for me to, to, to grow in respect. And I like that. All those thoughts. How much of your background as a doctor played a role in assimilating and, and the segue from where you were to where you are? That's, a, that's an excellent point, actually. Um, I think that uh, being a psychologist, you're, you're always looking carefully at what would help people, mm -hmm. right? And, and every day I hear people come in my office with deep pain. I mean, mm -hmm. they've got troubled marriages and depression and anxiety and seeking purpose in life. And so I've always drawn those type of connections. I've always thought the gospel has the answer mm -hmm. to, to much of that. But now I'm in this Adventist community mm -hmm. and I'm really sort of seeing with my own eyes, hey, these marriages look way stronger than the average marriage. I mean, you know, right, nothing is 100%. You know, right. we have the same human struggles in the Adventist church. But like on average, mm -hmm. you know, I'm seeing uh, like my in-laws, Carl and Anita Pekarik. I mean, over 60 years Wow. Married, you know, and I'm looking at these and I'm saying, wow, what, you know, what is this medicine mm -hmm. uh, that, that is leading to these great outcomes in families? And, and I'm looking at, I'm just looking at the, the way that faith for most Adventists mm -hmm. organizes everything else, their use of money, their use of time, their parenting, their dedication to marriage. And, and of course, these are so many of the things mm -hmm. that everybody in the world is seeking. Mm -hmm. Right? How do I how do I raise my kids um, in an environment where there's going to be positive influences? How do we how do we deal with all these pressures mm. of of narcissistic competition in society that doesn't lead anywhere? Mm -hmm. And here we have this community um, where there are different norms, where there are gospel norms. Mm -hmm. So I think being a psychologist who's looking at you know what works, you mm -hmm. know, just in a practical sense, was a part of my attraction. Yeah, and being able to say, wow, look at this. I know because in, the, in your practice as a psychologist, your role is to help people right. in their journey, uh, psychological journey, uh, relational journeys. And we thirst, for, we thirst for that moment when the person says, Doc, I got it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your help. I, mm -hmm. you know, I know it's been difficult for us, but thank you for hanging in there with me. And you're now seeing examples of what a healthy family should be, right. what it means to be, uh, are we gonna be in church all day, not just for like an hour and a half, mm -hmm. uh, or an hour, or don't we do whatever we want for the rest of the day, and all of a sudden you're in a community that says, oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute, from sunset right. to sunset, right. we celebrate the Sabbath. Right. That must have been an experience. Absolutely, or just the intensity of like starting kids out in cradle roll. <laughs> like, exactly. well, nobody starts from birth. What are you gonna do with them? And, and Dee said, you're gonna see what we're gonna do with them. We're gonna sing songs, we're gonna do things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and even that experience, it's like, wow, that, that's working. Mm -hmm. You know, these kids are already learning some things. They're already um, coming closer to Jesus mm -hmm. um, in that intense Adventist commitment to educating our youth, right. you know, just sort of everywhere. And, you've, and you began to see that Adventist Christianity uh, is not some cult-driven uh, uh, community, but not one that's Christ-centered. Absolutely. Because so often, you know, the, the opposite can be labeled. Right. They're a cult, but then you come into a community, you begin to see Christ is affecting from cradle roll. Exactly. All throughout marriage. Right. Well, let me continue that point, if I may. So, so uh, that leads into maybe the next step of the journey. So... Uh, so now I'm, you know, I'm kind of a, a, a member, but not a member. Right. <laughs> and uh, Dee and I go into our having children years. Yes. And um, we had some real highs and some real lows mm. during that period where I felt like the character of this community once again was revealed to us. Mm. Um, we uh, lost two sons mm. to neurological disorders our sons, Nikki and Maddie. Mm. Uh, the, the saddest two days of my life have been standing on the platform at Central wow. for those uh, funerals. Um, and the community was just incredible. Um, so loving, so supportive, um, reminding us the Lord is there, but not giving us pat answers, you know, not trying to run over the painful part, mm. really being willing to enter in with us in that. And in between the two boys, the birth of our daughter Delaney, who's mm. eight now, 
uh, and just being willing to enter into our joy uh, and being so blessed to have, we had kind of a baby boom okay. around that time when she was born. So we have this great cohort of families raising their families going forth together. Mm -hmm. And I'm just loving it. I'm just thinking, what, what more could a man ask of his church? Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm getting everything I need here. And then that brings me forth to, uh, you know, kind of the decision to be baptized. Uh, so at this point, I'm looking at my daughter Delaney and I'm thinking, Everybody wants the best for their kid, right? That's right. And I'm thinking, I really hope she'll marry an Adventist. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, there's no guarantees, but, you know, statistically, I'm feeling like her best chance of getting that incredibly dedicated Christian man for her husband is going to be in the Adventist church. And so I, I want the best for her. And here I am saying, Adventism is the best. Hmm. Well, why am I not giving myself the best then? Why am I not, okay. you know, kind of going all in? Uh, so that insight is hitting me. And at the same time, I had a spiritual experience at Camp Wakanda, at Camp Meeting in Wisconsin. Wow, I know that I spoke at that camp in 92. It's great, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. Very outdoorsy. It's become one of my favorite places. So uh, at Camp Meeting, I'm just walking the grounds. And you know, at Camp Meeting, it's like it's, like its own city during that time. That's you know, right. You're kind of your own community at that time. And I'm walking the grounds and I'm just, with all these wonderful, trustworthy people. And I'm looking around and I'm saying to myself, you know, this is probably what heaven would look like. Hmm. You know, I, I mean, if everybody, by God's grace, just followed the Ten Commandments, what a different world it would be. Say that again. If, if everyone, by God's grace, just followed the Ten Commandments, what a different world it would be. That's amazing. And why wouldn't I want to be part mm -hmm. of that community? You know, what's so powerful about that statement, I'm taking it from a person with the background you have. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard that before, but it gives a different gravity to it. You know, the G-forces increase mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when our listeners and viewers consider that uh, what you just said, and I'm going to not speak in the third person, was made by a person who went through the Catholic ministry, who was a priest, who went through the theological schools, who was ordained, who was in the ministry of Catholicism, mm -hmm. which we know traditionally that a traditional community and a biblical-based community, while the needs are identical, everybody wants to be happy, everybody wants to have solid families, everybody wants to have their right. pains and their hurts healed, that's the commonality of all the communities. But then you come out of a community based on a lot of traditions that have a rich heritage behind it mm -hmm. to one that's based on scripture, which says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you discover that that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as the pastor, and I go back a little bit, rewind the videotape. Yes, of course. When the pastor says, uh, uh, he, he, he starts reciting the commandments to you. And then he says, and so what's so bad about the Sabbath? That's a part of that whole <laughs> dialogue. Right. And, you, and you come out of that rich heritage. And so there are lights there are light bulbs coming on. Right. I go back to your analogy. There are 200 watt light bulbs Correct. coming along the way. Right. Talk about that. I mean, because these bulbs are just. Right. It just feels like everything's pointing me in the same yeah. way. Right. I mean, I've seen the rich biblical foundations. I'm seeing the uh, the proof is in the pudding. I'm seeing the community and, and the intensity of their uh, discipleship. Mm -hmm. uh, like a, at a level I've just never seen anywhere before. Um, I'm, I'm getting to know them up close and personal, right? They're, they've been with me through highs and lows. Um, and then I'm thinking about what I want for my daughter and mm -hmm. having this experience at Camp Wakanda. Uh, and then the story wouldn't be complete without uh, talking about Pastor Sheldon Bryan, yes. who's originally from Jamaica, but he came in, okay. came in from Salt Lake City uh, Church over to, to, to become the pastor at Milwaukee Central. Mm -hmm. And um, he's so good at outreach. And this is just sort of catching fire a little bit uh, with me. I'm seeing him reaching the young people uh, again in a new way. and. Uh, and, and visiting the sick, and he's, he's out there meeting everybody. And I'm sitting there as a psychologist going, I think there's something that this community has to offer the world mm -hmm. that's this dying world, this sort of lonely world. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have this pastor who's so good at outreach, 
Um, and he's sort of saying the same thing. He's able to dialogue about all the contemporary issues, mm -hmm. you know, in the frame of, of biblical Adventism. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of attracted, like, well, this is all coming together. I really want to be part of that. Mm. Um, and this is, this is the kind of outreach I, I really want to be part of. Um, and so it's just like multiple pointers are just all sort of pointing me um, to uh, going all in and, and joining, and I was baptized by Pastor Sheldon. Wow, and you mentioned Jamaican. My wife has a Jamaican background. Oh. Born in England, but her family's yes. Jamaican. And uh, as I'm listening, the picture that just came to my mind, no pun intended, is that all along the way, the Lord was brush stroking, uh, br brush -stroking a, tap, a, p a painting of your journey, and your baptism was just the framing of it. Right. Because right. it didn't just get taken on that day. It didn't just come to fruition. It didn't just start happening. You didn't right. just fall in love with the Lord on the day of baptism, but you were part of this consistent journey. Absolutely. A theological journey, a relational journey, a journey through hard times and tears, a journey of loss and renewal, a journey of new beginnings. And your wife, Dee, talk about her. All of this, she's patiently watching this Correct. journey happen. I gotta, give me some of her insights. Well, again, <laughs> I, I think she, you know, I mean, I think there's a great uh, truth in Adventism about religious freedom. I think okay. we're, we're more into that than almost anybody right. uh, in understanding that notion of a free choice of worship. Right. And I felt like she really gave me that all through. Mm -hmm. You know, she said, um, you know, come and see it. Uh, and, and yet there was a sense of, Hey, if you if you are uh, needing to be kind of where you're at, which is sort of close but not quite a member, if that's where you need to be right now, um, that's okay. We'll but keep, I love you we'll anyhow. We'll keep walking the journey, right? Um, and of course, we really worked out that Delaney was being raised in, yeah. in the Adventist Church, which was important to her. Um, and so, uh, you know, she was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, all along, and, and I think trusting in the Holy Spirit. It, you know, we knew that our marriage was fruitful. We knew that the Lord was with us mm -hmm. and would guide our path. Um, right. And so for her, I don't think there was a lot of anxiety. I think she, uh, she, she always believed we would end up where we were meant to be. That's a, that's a powerful, I mean, that's a powerful testimony mm -hmm. to the patience of a saint. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> can I use that phrase? <laughs> because Revelation 14, 12, you know, here they, they keep the commandments of God. Right. Here the, the faith, the pa here's the patience of the saints. So a commandment keeper should also be a patient, patient person. That's right. That's because right. Because the Lord is in charge of that journey. It just That's right. clicked. It just happened right now. Right. And so you're seeing the patience of a saint. Right. A one who says, um, <laughs> uh, Bob, hey, uh, could you pick up something when you come back from the store for me? Uh, and hey, you know, by the way, we're going to church tomorrow. Th that's all right. Tomorrow's the Sabbath. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I'll get it, honey. It'll kick in sooner or later. Right. And, then someday, and right. then one day it just kicks in, it locks in. Right. And then instead of saying, well, you know, are we going to go to church on Sunday? Uh, uh, Sabbath? You've had, did you have that kind of experience? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think it was important to Dee, of course, that, you know, Friday is a day of preparation. And I mean, it's bigger than, you know, just a small portion of the right. day. And so our family got into those rituals. And of course, it's addictive in a good sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it becomes so attractive to begin, you know, again, she didn't have to force it on me. It just, I'm a very hard worker. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just part of my personality. Mm -hmm. And it became attractive to me to look forward mm -hmm. uh, to being able to step away from all of that uh, and slow things down and, and really just, you know, be with the Lord and be with the community. So I think she knew what she was doing mm -hmm. um, and, and just sort of let it be attractive mm. uh, to me. And, and, uh, and it worked. And, you know, you bring out a point that's so, so often overlooked. A lot of times people think that, you know, that we just go to church on Saturday, but the whole rest aspect of the Sabbath is something that uh, if you look at the Jewish practice, even, even among those who didn't accept Jesus, uh, when they looked at the Sabbath, it was a preparation that started midweek. They, they right. knew that Friday was right. coming. They knew that this time was coming. And they started gearing their minds and their practices and their schedule and their shopping, everything around that, so that when the sun set on Friday, they were ready to welcome the family into a new, I, I refer to it as a canopy of blessings. Right. And as a hard worker who, you know, the job you do is not just demanding physically, but it's demanding psychologically. Right. And you're dealing with people who really, right. sometimes you could go home and say to your wife, Dee, wow, just, today was a tough day. I had a, I had a tough day. And then she says, 
Bob, we can relax. Right, Sabbath is coming. Let's shut it down. And that's important. Talk about that because there's some Christians that are in the community of Christianity. I'm not saying Catholicism versus Adventism, uh -huh. but in the Christian community, uh, just as a psychologist and as a one who discovered and now embraced the Sabbath and this whole new walk with Christ, uh, kind of communicate that. There may be somebody watching the program that right. may say, well, I'm not Catholic and I'm not Adventist, right. but what has the Sabbath meant to you? I mean, what is what has it done? How has it transformed your life? Right. Well, I think it's one of those things. Um, I will frame it in not just the individual, but society's search right now, if mm -hmm. I may. I, I mean, there's there's so many ironies right now uh, that about everybody's looking for these answers, and we're sitting here and we've got the medicine. Um, but somehow making that connection. I mean, that's what I, I see as, as part of my mission as a family ministry coordinator. We have so much medicine for individuals and families. Mm. Um, and the Sabbath would be one of those medicines God has mm. provided, right? I mean, so th there's just so many ironies, pastors. So there are psychologists literally writing articles today that sound like this. You know, if only we could find a way to get these families off of their phones and screens and, and actually spend time, if, if they would just pick some time that they would spend together interacting with each other, that would be so good for their mental health. And I'm sitting there going, hello, we have that, the Sabbath, right? That's right. I mean, you see the irony in that, that people are saying, where, what structure, what, what wisdom could make this happen? And, and here it's, it's, it's ancient wisdom sitting, wow. sitting right here, right? Um, I mean, that's just one example mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of what we have to offer that is, is just a, a healing kind of bomb, right? Or, or similarly, we, we sort of have, uh, we've got psychologists saying, oh, this is becoming an addictive society. You know, everybody's, everybody's addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or something. You know, if only we could have some communities of support to get people out of this where that's not the norm and where there's, you know, where, where there's sort of a different way of coping. And I'm sitting there thinking, hey, it, it Adventist church, mm -hmm. you know, s s communities that by and large, um, you can trust that. Uh, that peer group for your kids, there's going to be some strong norms against, you know, addiction as the answer. Amen. Right? So we, we, we sort of have these things, and it, it, is, it is a real challenge of, of how do we bridge that gap mm -hmm. and help people to, to take a look and experience uh, some of that great, great medicine that we have to offer. That, I, I, I love that evangelistic approach because you, you, you just... Um, from a professional perspective as a psychologist, mm -hmm. from a Christian perspective as one whose journey is rich, and from an experiential perspective, you've pulled together the, the, uh, the key components in what our world is in need of. Mm -hmm. uh, rest, right. something our generation has forgotten how to do, right. rest. I mean, we're continually connected. 24-7, you can watch television anytime, anywhere, anyhow, right. on any device, right. your phone included. And the world has kept us uh, in, a, in a, let me use this phrase, in a dopamine flooded society. Exactly, okay. exactly. You know. And it's not working. I mean, you can look at research. Um, there's a book called iGen about the generation coming after the millennials and some studies of their mental health. And this book points out there's a literal epidemic of depression and anxiety mm. among children and teens, um, college freshmen, uh, there have been surveys done year after year for 50 years of college freshmen, and college freshmen are reporting with the highest level of mental health symptoms ever in history to their freshman year. They're already flooding the counseling center before they've taken, you know, half of a semester of classes. Wow. And uh, this book points out a strong link to the social media mm -hmm. addiction and how that causes depression and anxiety. Uh, in the same book, they find one of the most robust protective factors against being depressed and anxious as, as a child or teen, mm -hmm. involvement in church activities. Wow. So, you know, again, this is like hiding in plain sight. I like it's that. It's hiding in plain sight. And how do we get that message out um, that, that what we have is, is eternal wisdom about how people are meant to connect and live? Mm -hmm. um, here's another one. There's this sort of growing movement about like, get out in the natural world. 
there's studies that show that taking a walk in the woods raises your mood, you know, and so, so psychologists are saying, maybe we could invent nature therapy, you know, where you go <laughs> walk in the woods. And I'm thinking, okay, how much of our Sabbath activities are all about typically getting, getting out in the creation, experience the creator's creation, study his creation, spend time in creation. You see the irony here? Right. We're looking for these answers. We have these answers. We have to find ways to make sure we're getting that information out there. That is a beautifully attractive way. I, I mean, I'm, as a pastor, I'm, I'm, I have all these lights going off mm. in, in ways of presenting this rich community of Adventist Christianity in a world that is really being drained, looking for something that is right there. Mm -hmm. It's like the guy on the roof of his house and the water is rising and a, a car comes in the heavy rains and he says, I'm waiting for somebody to deliver me and then the boat comes right, and a helicopter right, comes right. and, he's, and he's drowning right, right, right. and he's missing what's right there being yeah. presented to him. Yeah. And that's been your experience. Absolutely. I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, there's so much there's so much research on this, I could go on a long time. I mean, that, that, that marriages, you know, if, if couples view the marriage bond as sacred, not just a human contract, their marital satisfaction is greater. Mm -hmm. If they view sexuality as sacred, their sexual satisfaction is greater. Mm -hmm. um, if they are men who attend church, spend more t their free time with their kids instead of in solitary pursuits. I mean, we could go on and on about right. the influence of a vibrant community like the Adventist Church and the way that it um, supports so much of where God wants us to be mm -hmm. in healthy families. And that's wow. part of the message I want to get out. Yeah, that's, and, that's, and that's what you do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's toast it down to the ministry of your church, what you do during the week. So, so my, uh, my paid job is a clinical psychologist. I see basically patients, uh, you know, as well as help run the business because mm -hmm. um, somebody's got to do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then uh, my primary ministry at Milwaukee Central, along with Dee, is we're family ministry coordinators. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've, over the last couple of years, we've been doing some parenting seminars. We've mm -hmm. done a marriage seminar. Um, we've done some social events. We help co-sponsor the, the financial literacy program. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, part of what we're doing with that is we're trying to let people know that we care about what they care about. You know, right. we understand that um, you know, if Ellen Wedge said the, the health message is like a, a, a if Ellen White said it's a wedge, mm. that, that people will say, well, why? Why do these people live in so long? Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting thing. I think, I think the mental health message could be the even more powerful wedge today uh, for right. people to stand up and say, what's up with those families? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they look like their, their kids really um, have good self-control and... Uh, are, are, are not in a completely depressed state all the time or you know, aren't getting addicted uh, to drugs. What's going on with that? Mm. Um, and so we've, we've begun trying to do these programs and publicize them in the community mm -hmm. um, so that maybe somebody will come uh, who's interested in improving their parenting and, and sort of find out some of the, the real power behind our parenting, you know, which wow. is Jesus. That's, I mean, this is very, this is so informative to me. It's more than just the journey of, uh, you know, where you've come from theologically, but just the, now the other side of this coin, the answer to a society that's actually melting around us, mm -hmm. driven uh, by the pursuit of happiness, but right. not knowing that happiness doesn't have to be pursued. It's right here to be experienced. Exactly, exactly. That's really well said. And, and there's sort of different types of happiness, right? right. There's sort of... I mean, there's hedonism, which is, you know, avoidance of pain right. and seeking constant pleasure. And, and, and studies actually show that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's where addiction comes in. You need a mm -hmm. bigger dose just to get the same effect. And ultimately that runs out anhedonia. of gas. Anhedonia. Whereas, right, anhedonia. Whereas people who seek meaning mm -hmm. and fulfillment, which is a deeper kind of happiness, right? And right. of course, the gospel is our meaning. That's it's right. easy to see if you look in. The battle is with the sin in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's so easy to see that's what we're here for. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the grace is what allows you to win that battle. It's just, if you really reflect on it, it's just easy to see that's, that's what we're here for. And, and uh, when people realize what we're here for and they're seeking that fulfillment of that mission, mm -hmm. then they are happy. That's right. As a byproduct of knowing 
that they're aligned with what God wants them to do and they know they're working towards something that's eternally good. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, it is the secret to happiness in a sense. I'm gonna use an odd comparison. You know, have you heard of the Cheesecake Factory? Yes. Okay, people like cheesecake because it tastes good. You don't have to scream at somebody and say, please eat this cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not once a hard you, sell. <laughs> once right. you taste right. it, you say, right. oh, I gotta get a slice of cheesecake. Right. I'm in town, I know there's a cheesecake factory somebody, somewhere by. Yeah. The Lord has put together, excuse my illustration, a spiritual cheesecake factory mm -hmm. where if you taste, you'll see that the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. And I say this not in the exclusion of other communities, sure. but I'm an Adventist pastor for that very reason. I saw it in different communities, Baptist, Nazarene, Catholic, mm -hmm. Pentecostal. I looked at that as a young man to see, can I live this life and still be saved? Mm -hmm. And I came to discover that, wow, uh, while there are good things in each of those communities, this is the more complete package. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we believe, as John 10, 16 says, other sheep the Lord has that are not of this fold. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you look and you say, well, I'm looking for the, the cleanest, most complete picture of the shepherd and all he has to offer. And it's found here in this community. And uh, I want to give people an opportunity to get, a, get in touch with you to find out how they could invite you and your wife and, and your daughter to come and, and benefit if they're in the Milwaukee area to come to your church and visit your community. Uh -huh, sure. But uh, if you could invite, if you could be invited to come and maybe share some of these things in other communities. And so if you're listening on the radio and uh, you've been blessed by this, and I have uh, been blessed by um, Dr. Knorr, Dr. Robert Knorr's uh, insight and experience, here's the information that you need to be able to get in touch with him, to contact him, to invite him to your community, and to find out that the spiritual journey has so many components to it that it also contains the answers to many of the ills of our world today, both young and old, whether you're a baby boomer, a Gen X, a millennial, the answer comes in the complete picture of Christ. If you want to know more about that, here is the information that you need to get in touch with Dr. Knorr. If you're interested in inviting Dr. Robert Knorr and his family to share his testimony and how God led his life to a new beginning, you can contact him at Milwaukee Central SDA Church, 2229 North Terrace Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53202. Again, that's Milwaukee Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, 2229 North Terrace Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53202. Or you can email him at rnohr at me.com. Again, that's rnohr at me.com. I know you have been blessed by this program, and I'm going to give Dr. Robert Knorr uh, 30, 40 seconds to kind of communicate with our listeners and our viewers, because your journey has been so rich. But if you had a, a parting thought that you'd like to leave with those who listen to the program today, what would that be? Well, I do. I, I think that, uh, you know, in 1 John, Jesus says to Andrew, who's interested in him, he says, come and see come and take a look for yourself. And I would just urge anyone who wants to understand what the Adventist Church is about, uh, you won't get it by reading about theological debates on the internet. Um, you will get it by coming and seeing and spending time with the Adventist people. And I think you'll be blessed if you take that invitation. Wow. Dr. Noor, it's been rich yeah. for me and I have, as a pastor, been able to take my sponge and dab from this interview, things that have really enhanced my day also. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Blessings on you and your wife and your community and the work you do there in Wisconsin. God bless you. Thank you very much, Pastor. And uh, thank you for taking the time to tune in today. We know that the blessing comes in waves. Today the Lord has a blessing for you. Take that journey with Him and you'll find complete richness in knowing Christ. God bless you until we see you again.